All right, in this tutorial I want to talk about combining two different scenes, one in the foreground, another one in the background, uh, and make them uh, change focus. Basically as if we had the camera uh, focusing on the background first and then changing into focusing on the foreground. Now, So right now I have two layers here. It's a static image, it's not an animation yet. Um, and the background was generated, of course, with our uh, 3D designer uh, generating a terrain. Um, and um, if I hide the foreground image, we can see it here. That actually, that elevation map was created based on the same image here. Right? What I did is I uh, inverted that. I um, created a very blurry version of that. And that was the starting point as the, for the elevation map. I may have flipped it upside down or rotated it or whatnot, but in the end, um, you can create, you can use that as the elevation map and add erosion to it, coloring, texturing, uh, fog, uh, and other things, lighting, shadows, and soon enough you'll see a nice uh, hilly landscape. Um, I'm not going to go into how I created that in details. We've seen about 30 or 40 tutorials now on the River Canyon series, and that will explain how to make this landscape uh, very quickly. What I want to do, though, is first of all, uh, congratulate and thank uh, the author of this particular uh, image that is actually part of a brush collection that is available at DAZ. Um, and it was created, it's, it's a brush collection that's in Photoshop format, ABR files. So I used Photoshop to actually extract that image, render it, save it as a PNG, and then take that into Dog Waffle. Because to the best of my knowledge, we don't have a way yet to uh, load that ABR file directly. Maybe in the future, but uh, right now uh, I just use a workaround. And once I have it here uh, as a stored image, I can do all sorts of magic with it. And um, okay, let's see who actually that uh, image uh, came from. And of course, it's uh, these are brushes by Don, uh, Don De Divine, and uh, Don's brushes are also known as such. Uh, great collection of uh, images and uh, you know birds in air, birds on branches, trees, all sorts of collections of different types. And so what you have here is uh, an example of one of those. Uh, turned into a relatively low resolution image now, just uh, good enough to take it through this tutorial. And what I wanted to do is uh, load it into a separate uh, layer. So let me, let me show again how I did that. Uh, let me get rid of this layer. So here's the original image that was rendered. And I'm going to use that as the background image. And then um, I create a new layer. Let's go here. And even though we don't do layers with opacity per pixel automatically, we can certainly use an image like this one um, and uh, put that in there. And because white will multiply with whatever color is in the background by default, it will uh, still keep that original color. Black will turn everything black. So that works. That turns out working just fine. It looks like an opaque, transparent, uh, you know, a usable layer. Uh, and we can do all sorts of things to that. We can uh, use the transform uh, shift filter, for instance, to shift it around and give it a different position. This one is a shifting that will uh, wrap around to the other side. Uh, that may not be what we want. Maybe we uh, need to work on this uh, differently and perhaps we want instead to transform it. So there is a filter uh, transform option as well. And what you do with that one is to move it around, but it has another caveat, and that's when it reaches the end of it, it's uh, forcing it to opaque black. So that's also not exactly the perfect solution, except if you want to actually scale it and rotate it, you might be able to just find the uh, alignment or the position that you want. All right, that's uh, one of the techniques. There is another technique, and that's to actually use this as a brush. So if I clear this image, and I'm still on that layer, I'm going to stamp this image down just exactly like you would under uh, in Photoshop if you use it as a brush, which is how it was intended to be used to begin with. Uh, you can use it uh, with the alpha or just as a brush image. Uh, plain white will be opaque, but as a layer multiply layer, uh, it will, that's the default, it's really a multiply mode layer. Uh, it will be uh, something like this. So you can enable the preview, you see it here, the moment you stamp it down, uh, it becomes uh, transparent. The white part is multiplied to the next layer below it. So that's that's a good way to use it too and not worry about, you know, I don't need to see the entire image, maybe only part of it. 
Um, maybe you want to flip it, use X for flipping it sideways or horizontal, uh, Y for flipping it vertically. Uh, so you could you could have bats instead of birds, right? <laughs> uh, you could, uh, let's do an undo here. Uh, you can also uh, make that brush uh, appear transparent in the preview as well, uh, simply by using the right button here on the brush pickup tool. That allows you to key to a different color like white and adjust the low clip and high pass levels for that keying. And then so that way you don't actually see too much of the white opaque in the preview and you get to see the background better and position your image uh, or your brush relative to that. So let's go and flip it vertically again. And let's say we want to have some of the birds over here and then we flip it sideways or, or maybe we just use this side. So you could do that in a symmetric way or in an asymmetrical way. Let's uh, let's get uh, let's zoom out a little bit and move this over here, and then uh, I'm going to have a few more birds over here, so maybe a little bit lower. All right, but the idea is essentially to have an image that represents the very near foreground, and then another image in the background with that beautiful scene. And now let's go uh, disable the preview of the brush. We don't need that anymore and uh, see how to, to blur one or the other. Right? Because they are in two separate layers, we can blur one, uh, such as, for instance, the background. We can go and select Blur under the filters, and Gaussian Blur is a good one. Bokeh Blur, too, really nice. And uh, with that, you'll be able to, to blur the background uh, to a great extent and uh, start really focusing on uh, what's up close. That's one way to do that. Another way is, let's say, oh, to the contrary, let's blur the foreground. Let's go filter, blur, let's use a different one, maybe not bokeh, let's use uh, 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 Gaussian blur, for instance. That's a very popular one you'll see in, in any image program. Uh, so that's another way to do it. And now what I'd like to do is really do an animation where we blur the background more and more as we unblur the foreground. Right, so we uh, we need to essentially have two images that we then animate each independently and then combine them back together. So let's uh, work first on uh, this one here. Let's see this image. We need to store a copy of that image, store image, and so we have this reference image. We have this one here for the background. All right, so let's uh, let's go outside of the filters. Uh, I mean, outside of the layers now. We can uh, delete this one. Let's work on this one here. So what we'll do is we'll do an animation of, let's say, 100 frames just to make it quick, or 99 to make it even faster, uh, 30 frames per second for the playback. So here is our, our animation of the background. Right now, nothing is changing. And what we want to do is have it crisp initially and get more and more blurry over time. Now, the way to do that is to use the timeline and change the amount of blurriness that we give it. Right. So we could go something like this here and um, go to the blur group. There it is. Maybe use the, uh, the Gaussian blur and say at first we have no blur. Let's bring the Gaussian blur to zero uh, and keyframe that, right? create a key. So it remembers that particular level of blur that you want for this first frame. Then you go to the last frame. Right? Or maybe even a slightly before the end of the animation, you'll want to reach that level and then kind of contemplate and keep that. And you want it fully blurred, right? something like this. And in fact, this one here, you also might want to hold for a little while. You don't necessarily change your focal length for your, your focus right away. Right? So you can adjust when that actually starts changing. And go, let's apply that. So now we have essentially a sequence of frames right here at the beginning that are not going to change. And then we have some changes uh, getting blurry and blurrier. And then eventually it's staying at that highest level of blur. And once that's done, we may want to store that and keep it aside for future use. And uh, there is perhaps one other thing we could do, and that's to, to add a little bit of movement to that. Because right now, um, if you look at this here, we have that blurriness happening. It's very blurry at the end. Uh, maybe we want to also have a little bit of a, I don't know, a zooming out or zooming in, a very tiny little motion. So what I'd recommend is we try this. And we can always undo that later if you don't like it. Let's go to the transform and give it a little bit zoom, a little bit scale at first. 
and then later scale it back down as we uh, get blurry. So we start like this, a little bit crisper, closer like that. Um, and somewhere around here is where that starts. And then around here, we go back to 100% uh, on, on the scale. Something like that. So we get a very uh, slight uh, movement as well that's, uh, that appears a bit of a zooming. It's not like we're moving close in or out to the scene, but just the, the fact of changing the blur might give us also a little bit of twist on the angular aperture and um, you know we kind of mimic a bit of a, another side effect to that. So now here is the animation we have so far and that's the one for um, the background. All right, so this one we will want to save um, or like as an AVI file or at least store it so we can quickly use it again later. So I'm going to store this to disk and um, as soon as we have that one stored we can uh, we can move on to the next. This is uh, going to take some uh, disk space and my hard drive is a little bit full and probably uh, scattered all over the place, cluttered, so I need to uh, to be a bit more patient on saving that. There it is. So now we have this animation with just the background. Right, so now I'm going to switch over to the foreground. I'm going to put this one in and say, yeah, let's create also something like uh, um, 99 frames on that one. 99 frames like here. and uh, But this time I will go and do the opposite on the blur. I'm going to do a blur where it's blurry initially and then I'm going to reduce it to crisp uh, later on. Right? So I'm going to go right here to the same blur tool and there it is. Maybe I'm going to use the simple blur or well, let's use a Gaussian blur, why not? So give it quite a bit of blur, same amount as we had at the end of the prior animation, why not? About here and then um, go to about here and reduce to no blur. So now the foreground is crisp and apply that. So it's very simple. We have one animation that gets blurry, the other one that gets crisp. And then we need to combine the two in a way that we end up uh, making it look like we are really changing the focus on the camera and uh, both the background gets uh, blurry and the foreground gets crisp, both together. So kind of a synchronized effect there. We might also want to have a little bit of movement on the, on the trees. Remember what we did there? We, uh, oh, before we do that, let's just uh, check out what we currently have. Uh, we see the, the birds and the trees getting crisper. That's good. Uh, maybe too much, but uh, you know, it's just a quick demo to show the ideas and the concept. So now what we want to do is to also add a little bit of transform. And with that transform, it's again the idea that uh, maybe we also change the angle a little bit on the camera. So we may want to start zoomed out and then come in a little bit zoomed in. It will also make it, as it gets crisper, it will bring the focus to us because it appears closer. It will kind of force the eye to really look at it even better. So we'll start around here um, with this scale and then here, we will have it a little bit bigger, right? And nothing prevents you from even doing a little bit of a side motion, but be careful not to give it too much. The background would not be moving much. The foreground could potentially, so yeah, it's okay to try that a little bit too. Okay, and keyframe that, all right? And so now we apply that as well. And again, if you don't like it, click undo. Make sure the save undo is checked so that you have an option to do one level of undo across the entire animation. And um, we should be done pretty soon with this. Just another 70 or another 30 or 20 frames. And uh, I think we have the animation ready to... Oh, no, we moved too much here. So you see the black area at the top. So let's click undo and uncheck. I'm going to grab this uh, key here and uh, kill it. So I still have this one here. I'm going to go back to this one without animation. Let me reset the position, the parameters and uh, simply go here and keyframe it with a little bit of zoom, but that's it. Okay, all right, so that's the one I'm gonna use. No transform sideways, no movement, um, because we, we don't want to accidentally have a black border appear. If we move too far, it's difficult to predict. Uh, so let's just uh, keep it like this, uh, easy cheesy. And uh, now we have an animation that we can use for the foreground. So here we go, play that just to check it. Uh, sure enough, it starts blurry and it gets crisp. 
All right, so the next thing we want to do is, of course, to combine the two. And uh, so what we'll need to do is perhaps have a safe copy of this, save it to disk, or store it rather. Um, and so we have the original here and then the animated foreground uh, coming up uh, in a second. And then once we have those two, we can simply use the, the tool called combine, right? Combine with swap. We can combine two image sequences. One is the one that you see in the foreground. That's your main animation, your one and only. And so that's the one that we, for instance, would keep right near now here. We don't, we can, we can keep, that's the one in the foreground, we'll keep that. That's your main uh, image sequence. That's your main um, animation. And uh, what we can do is we can replace it or we can say, no, let's put something else in the swap image. Now in the swap image, there's nothing right now. If, if we toggle here, there's the S for toggle jumping to the swap image, or you can do that here from the image menu, um, jump to the swap image. As you do that, you'll see something else here. This, this was uh, from when I did the, the texturing on the terrain with, in 3D Designer. We don't need this anymore. And what we want instead, um, let me switch back to the main image. What we want instead is actually use this stored animation that adds the blurriness. We want to have that one used as the swap image, the sequence, right? So we simply check this box here on the stored copy of this animation. Um, what we'll do is we'll check this box to say use as animated swap, right? Using this as an animated swap image means that as we render a combination of the two or if we do any sort of animated rendering across filters, if it needs the swap image, it's not going to use what's already there. It's going to use it from this stored image sequence. It's going to go to the first frame as it renders the first frame. It's going to go to the next frame as it renders the next frame and so on. So it's going to go through that during the render. It's going to pull these images to use as the animated swap. And the one we have in the front here is the animated main image sequence, your main animation. The two together will be combined. You can actually preview it here, but now, right now, you see exactly what's gonna happen here. All right, so you can see uh, in the preview, uh, if you click this box here, it shows you actually a blend of the two together. And uh, you can right click here to see uh, what the layer mode is. Multiply is the default, but you could do other things here. You could do all sorts of funky stuff, tracing paper and get very different effects. Some of them absolutely beautiful too. You know, you get this very light appearance on the background. But so this is a great way to, to preview what's gonna happen. Um, let's keep it in multiply or default mode. The default mode is the multiply mode. And so now you can see that initially we have the foreground um, very blurry and the background is uh, crisp. And as we go through the animation, it's gonna switch to the other way. So that's exactly what we want to do. How do we combine the two together? There's two ways to do that. The fastest way probably right here from the filter menu and say combine with swap. All right, so what you could do is um, actually, there are three ways. Uh, so you can, you can do it right here. You can say multiply and then it will ask you, do you want to do that over the entire animation sequence? Since it sees that there is an animation, boom, that will do it. Another way to do it is uh, in this preview uh, option here from this icon, when you right click and you say merge with swap, it will there too detect that you could actually do that across the entire image sequence. So that's another place where you could do that. And then there is yet another way, and that's particularly important if you want to actually change and modulate how much blending you want, uh, right? That's the technique we used earlier in the lightning and lighting combination in the storm. So what we have in this case is with the timeline editor, uh, we have a similar option to combine with swap. There it is, combine with swap. And instead of using the mix buffers, which lets you switch from one to the other, right? And you can keyframe those mixes. Instead of doing that, what you could do is use uh, multiply the two together. And that way it will just be uh, pretty much what you were looking for here. And we don't need to keyframe. There are no parameters to keyframe. So, uh, it will just multiply pixel for pixels the one that's in the animated swap with the one that's in the main animation and um, that's what we can do so uh, i'm gonna go the the easiest way perhaps and that's with this uh, preview mode here i'm gonna right click and say merge with swap and there do again uh, do we want to merge uh, across all frames yep let's do that and so now you see that combination of both image sequences um, and the final result is that you have an animation like this. All right, so 
<laughs> there is um, no other things you might want to do. Perhaps some movement on those uh, foreground birds and trees. Perhaps uh, make the whole animation slower now. Let's see what the dimensions are on this in the first place. Image info. Uh, it's a pretty high resolution image because uh, this came from a uh, Photoshop brush image collection. So we uh, we actually ended up having a fairly high resolution image. Uh, I'm gonna go and bring this down to a little bit uh, smaller. Um, let's say maybe we want to crop to a portion of that in the first place. So I'm going to go to image crop, uh, crop tool and say, you know what, we need just about this much, a little bit more wide angle appearance, perhaps, um, something like this, All right? And that would be one thing we could do uh, first, crop to that. And then once it's cropped to that entire image sequence, we can also resample it to uh, better uh, make it the size we want. Perhaps we're working at uh, uh, high definition, uh, let's say 1920 by 10. See, right now we're still pretty high resolution. Um, 1920 by 1080, maybe we want it less than that, 720p. So let's see what the dimensions are right now. It's still very high. Uh, and of course, we when we go with this manual crop, we can also accidentally get odd numbers. That's not a good dimension to keep. Uh, let's go and resample that. All right, so let's see if we can get it down to 1920. It's actually it's a little bit off the aspect ratio from the the regular standard HD. You know, not 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 to worry. I'm gonna go uh, 1280 on this, and I'm gonna go make it of course 720 to match on that. And uh, so then at that point you have the animation the way you want it before you load it into your final video project, or perhaps uh, you put that in your website, or you put that in. Um, I don't know, on YouTube or, or wherever it needs to go next. Um, so hopefully this will uh, give you some ideas of how you can combine two image sequences um, in multiply mode. There's plenty of other modes to try as well and get other effects from those. Uh, thanks for watching and uh, happy howling and waffling.